The same all over the world, here as in my country. Forgive my butting in, sir. English justice isn't the same. It differs in many ways from the justice of any other country. I'd like to show you some of our courts and tell you something about our system of law. Though it's a very big subject, it began a long way back. A thousand years ago, there were many different ways of settling disputes. One of the most common was trial by ordeal. The Normans introduced trial by combat, in which the accused fought it out with the accuser. A big step towards establishing a sound system of justice was Magna Carta, which confirmed the right of every Englishman to a fair trial by his equals. Down the passage of time, English law has slowly and steadily developed. Early in its history, two main trends became apparent. The law drawn from the accumulating judgments pronounced in the courts of the past, this is known as precedent and largely governs civil cases, and statute law, based on acts passed by Parliament in response to changing public opinion. This mainly governs criminal cases. The past has laid a trail of wisdom, a guide to present justice and a signpost to its future. These modern books of law are the fruits of generations of striving for a code of fairness. Their roots spring direct from the lives of the ordinary people of the land. Here's a modern magistrate's court in a typical English town. You, the public, have right of entry here. Let's go in and see what justice looks like. Next case, John Robert Simpson, Your Worship. Case of cattle spraying on the highway. He's here in court. This way, John Robert Simpson. John Robert Simpson, you are summoned with being the owner of cattle found on the 5th of January last... That man now speaking is the clerk to the magistrates. He is usually a solicitor and advises the court on legal points. He's just finished reading out the summons. Do you plead guilty or not guilty to the charge? The defendant has now to plead guilty or not guilty to a charge of being the owner of cattle found straying on the highway. He's a countryman and not used to court procedure. The clerk will obviously have to make him conform to the rules. On all technical matters, the clerk is the guide to magistrates who will eventually make their decision. Yes, yes, all right, all right. This fellow understand the correct procedure. He's a bit upset, I'll explain. Before the case goes any further, Mr. Simpson, you must formally submit a plea of guilty or not guilty. Reckon I says not guilty, then. These small-town magistrates have the power to deal with a wide variety of minor offences. They cannot hear a case alone, for they are not professional legal men. 
they are ordinary men and women, local citizens with a good record of public service. This service, vital to a nation's social and domestic peace, is in England voluntary and unpaid. This young man is the principal witness. He is the motorist who made the original complaint to the police. Holding the Bible, he takes an oath to tell the truth. Will you repeat the words on the card, please? I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I give to the court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. In this case, the police inspector acts as prosecutor. In our country, the prosecutor has not in any sense inquisitorial powers, as is customary in some parts of the world. Here, his duty is to lay before the court the whole of the facts as they are known to the prosecutor, including those favourable to the defendant. Now the defendant has his chance to ask the witness any questions which may turn the scales to his advantage. Didn't I tell you how them cattle happened to stray? No, your actual words to beware. Some mischief-making fool or other must have broken the fence. That's all I want to ask you. I don't re-examine. Right, Mr. Burton, you may go now. Both sides are finished with the witness. The chairman of the bench will now explain to the defendant his rights. You may elect to give evidence on your own behalf, but it's my duty to warn you that if you do go in the witness box, you'll be liable to cross-examination by the prosecution. Oh. And supposing I stays here and says what I has to say? You may make a statement which may be taken into consideration, but you'll not be placed on oath. Why, then I'll stay here. He's made his choice. He'll stay out of the witness box and thus avoid the trained questions of people more accustomed to legal proceedings than himself. All defendants have the right to speak in their own defence, either from the witness box on oath, or from the dock, or, as in this case, from the floor of the court. Remember that here, as in all other English courts, the defendant is innocent until he is proved guilty. It is up to the prosecution to prove its case. How was I to know some mischief-making fool had broken down my fence, eh? I can't be in all places at once, can I? That's our idea of a fair hearing. As a matter of interest, the maximum penalty in that case is a five shilling fine. But the same sort of procedure is followed whether the case is of a minor nature or a serious criminal charge. They all begin in a court like that. Now there goes a more serious case. That young fellow has been committed for trial by a higher court. He'll be held in custody until the next quarter sessions. The procession is the prelude to these courts in some towns. First comes the sergeant at mace, the permanent official of the court. Behind him comes the mayor of the town, who sits on the bench as a sign of grace but takes no active part. Quarter sessions are usually presided over by a chairman with legal qualifications. He is supported on the bench by local magistrates, and barristers attend to represent the Crown as prosecution or as defence counsel for the accused. In England, legal aid is free if the prisoner satisfies the court he has not the means to pay for his defence. The great difference about a quarter sessions court is that there will be a jury. They are waiting now inside. Twelve good men and true, as they are sometimes called, drawn from every walk of life. Before each quarter session, the names of the next people due for service on a jury are chosen from a record kept by the local clerk of the peace. The summonses go out to ratepayers and to any citizens of respected character. In country towns, they are delivered personally by the official of the court, the sergeant at mace. In London, they arrive by post. A jury summons cannot be cast aside. Attendance at court on the specified day is compulsory, unless a special excuse can be produced that will satisfy the court. Business, or plans for pleasure, have to be set aside for that day, or even longer perhaps, if the case lasts more than one day. No money is paid to the jury in criminal cases. The service is regarded as a public duty. These quite ordinary people must assemble at the appointed time and place and their decision must be unanimous in all criminal cases. Here at the Central Criminal Court, 
commonly known as the Old Bailey, they are listening to the evidence in a case of murder. Face downward, sir, with the uh, right arm underneath her. You said it was about five minutes after the sound of the shot. Had a crowd gathered? A man's life is at stake. In this court, the basic principles of English law can be seen. Impartiality of the judge, free defense by barristers, if needed, the right of trial by jury, presumption of innocence of the prisoner, and trial in open court. The role of a judge is to guide and advise throughout the trial. He is almost invariably a famous lawyer with an extremely wide range of experience in criminal jurisdiction. Witnesses for the prosecution and the defense are examined by learned counsel. Medical. The prosecutor has called this witness to the box and will try to get further facts from her. After taking an oath similar to the one taken by the witness in the magistrate's court, she awaits the first question of the prosecuting counsel. Notice how careful he is to avoid putting a leading question, a question already containing the answer. Now, Miss Coombs, I want you to cast your mind back over a short period of time. Do you recognize the man you saw in the hotel corridor on the night in question? Yes. Is he present in court? Yes, he's the man in the dock. On that occasion, the one you referred to earlier in your evidence, was he carrying anything? Yes. What was he carrying? A revolver. Thank you. That is all. You'll notice the prosecuting counsel framed his questions so that the witness herself gave the facts. Are you certain of that? I think so. It was a badly lit corridor, I believe. It looked like a revolver. Might it not have been a small piece of metal? A wrench, for instance? Well, I... I thought it was a revolver. Thank you. That is a good example of our cross-examining method. Without unfair pressure, the barristers have one information which may sway the whole course of this trial. I think the jury are getting a little doubtful. You see, our system has the advantage of examining an important fact in the light of 12 widely differing viewpoints. This case is exciting wide public interest and is covered by newspaper reporters. A trial may be reported word for word in the press but no opinion can be printed until after a case is decided. There goes some copy for an early edition. Now we'll soon know. The judge is summing up. If you have the slightest doubt as regards this all-important fact, it is your duty to acquit the accused. This is sometimes known as the benefit of the doubt, but it is not a benefit, it is a right. You may feel, as two of the Crown witnesses would appear to feel, that there can be no doubt that the accused was indeed the man they saw emerging from room 43 at that particular moment. It is for these 12 ordinary men and women to make the decision of life or death. Bear in mind that according to English law, it is for the prosecution, first, last, and all the time, to prove beyond doubt the guilt of the prisoner. It is not for the prisoner to prove his innocence. When weighing up the aspects of the case you just heard, you must remember that the evidence of the prisoner should be given the same consideration as the evidence of any other witness. And finally, members of the jury, I must impress upon you that the judgment of this man in no way depends on me. You are the judges of the facts, and you alone. That is all the assistance I can give you in the matter. Will you consider your verdict? You will no doubt wish to retire to your room. I swear by Almighty God that I will well and truly keep... This man is the court usher, an official with similar functions to the sergeant at Mace. He promises on oath that he will lock the jury in a private room and see that no one influences them. Without leave of the court. Silence!
Guilty or not guilty? The answer is behind that door. A man's life rests in the hands of these 12 people. They may be gone 10 minutes, an hour, two hours. It may be any length of time. For whatever the decision, it must be unanimous. Meanwhile, the leading figures of the trial have to wait. The jury are returning and will answer to their names. They have in fact been absent three hours. Whatever they have decided, it will be the decision of them all. Richard Lee. Yeah. Herbert Blanford. Yeah. Charles Neal. Yeah. Edward Scott. Yeah. Kathleen Wright. Yeah. William Holding. Yeah. Members of the jury, are you agreed upon your verdict? We are. And do you find the prisoner guilty or not guilty of murder? Not guilty. Let the prisoner be discharged. Not guilty. The prisoner will be immediately discharged and can never be charged for the same offence again. Now, if the verdict had been guilty, you would have witnessed a very different scene and a custom going back many decades. Are you agreed upon your verdict? We are. And do you find the prisoner guilty or not guilty of murder? Guilty. And that is the verdict of you all? Yes. Prisoner at the bar, do you stand convicted of murder? Have you anything to say why sentence of death should not be passed upon you? Oh, yay, oh, yay, oh, yay. The Lords, the King's Justices, do strictly charge and command all persons to keep silence while the sentence of death is passed upon the prisoner at the bar upon pain of imprisonment. God save the King. Prisoner at the bar, you stand convicted of murder. The sentence of the court upon you is that you be taken from this place to a lawful prison and thence to a place of execution and that you be there hanged by the neck until you be dead, and that your body be afterwards buried within the precincts of the prison in which you shall have been confined before your execution. And may the Lord have mercy on your soul. Amen. In England, a death sentence does not necessarily mean a prisoner will be executed. A convicted man can appeal on a variety of grounds to the Court of Criminal Appeal in the Law Courts. Then, if he still believes he has just cause, with the leave of the Attorney General, he can appeal on a point of law to the House of Lords. And finally, the Home Secretary can advise the King to exercise the prerogative of mercy. According to this, the prisoner may either be reprieved and his death sentence commuted to penal servitude, or he is given a free pardon. These aspects of our legal system are fundamental to our way of life. English justice has its roots in concepts and ideals that are centuries old. It is a living thing, molded and shaped by time, but growing and adapting itself to the conscience of each successive age. <laughs>